ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله بلغ الرساله وادى الامانه ونصح الامه فصلى الله وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين وبعد the topic today is about the centuries centuries old feud that has split the entire muslim ummah up in half not in half perhaps not fair to say half but that this split has remained for a very very long time okay and guess me saying that it gives you an idea as to what i'm going to be talking about of course the rafidah the shia okay um obviously how it all started just to give you an idea into the history of the start of the rafidah um in the beginning when the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam passed away the issue of khilafa was left to the muslim and his companions they discussed among themselves who is to succeed the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam because uh, with an empire or a, a government perhaps as big as that encompassing so many different muslim countries it isn't proper for there to be not a single imam uniting all those lands together so there has to be one imam after the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and it was by the agreement of the companions that it was decided that abu bakr radhiyallahu an becomes the imam so it was decided by agreement that abu bakr radhiyallahu an will be the khalifa after rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and then after after abu bakr radhiyallahu an passed away umar ibn khattab took over the position after him there was uthman ibn affan radhiyallahu an and then they came a dispute why because uthman ibn affan radhiyallahu an he was unjustly killed in his house okay he was unjustly killed in his house and then there was a disagreement as to what should be done next should we appoint a khalifa next or should we first of all take revenge from those who killed uthman ibn affan so this is what what this is what caused the fitna in the muslim ummah at that time so ali ibn abi talib radhiyallahu an he was of the opinion that we should bring about some sort of law and order in the muslim land have some sort of stability and then we can see uh, who killed uthman ibn affan what were the motives and bring them to justice other companions like aisha radhiyallahu anha like az-zubair and talha like muawiya in sham they were of the opinion that no that we should seek revenge for the blood of uthman to start with and then we can decide who is to be the khalifa so this obviously ensued a lot of uh, friction amongst the companions themselves so right from the onset there was a group of people who were uh, followers of ali okay or the party of ali ibn abi talib and hence in arabic the party of ali is referred to as what shia, shia of ali shia what does shia mean party or a group okay of ali this is how the shia actually started they were good sahaba they were amongst the shia i mean the shia the supporters of ali radhiyallahu anhu that's that's it no more no less they did not uh, espouse the sort of belief that the shia today espouse such as cursing the companions such as negating and denying the khilafa of abu bakr and umar such as cursing aisha radhiyallahu anha and the rest of the wives of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam they were not like that at all it was purely a political movement that supported the case of ali radhiyallahu an that he should be the khalifa okay and on the other hand you had muawiya radhiyallahu an who uh, also wanted and also aisha radhiyallahu anha they all wanted uh, to take the revenge uh, for uthman radhiyallahu an and so on so what happened is that there was ma'raka of sufin to start with there was a battle between ali ibn abi talib and on the one side and aisha 
alayhi wa sallam. And Aisha, the wife of the Prophet sallam, and Zubair and Talha on the other side. Although they had not left their respective cities to actually come out and engage each other in a fight. It happened that uh, there was crossfire between both camps overnight which compelled people to fight against each other. Okay, this is how it all got triggered off. They weren't actually, they didn't actually leave their homes, they didn't actually leave the city to fight. So Aisha for instance did not leave uh, the city to fight Ali ibn Abi Talib and likewise Ali ibn Abi Talib wasn't actually coming to fight against Aisha anha. It just happened overnight. Munafiqeen, they started firing from both camps and which eventually triggered a fight between both Aisha and Ali radiallahu anhum. So, that battle, Ali radiallahu anhu was victorious and Aisha radiallahu anha, she was defeated and Az zubair and Talha were both killed in that battle. May Allah have mercy upon them both. And if, if you, obviously if you read into incidents as to how they were killed as well, they're actually running mm-hmm. away. Not running away, they actually they had dropped their weapons and they were pulling out, they were withdrawing from the battles because they didn't want to take part in those battles. Especially as Zubayr for instance, once according to a report, Ali radiallahu anhu reminded him that don't you remember when you were at my house with the Prophet sallallahu and the Prophet sallallahu said words to the effect that you uh, you are uh, that you want you are going to be fighting words to the effect that you are going to be fighting Ali radiallahu anhu one day oppressively words to the effect I can't remember exact uh, words of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and so when he was reminded of that he left the battle straight away okay and the same sort of story uh, is told about Talha now after this was over Ali radiallahu anhu had another challenger obviously. Uh, Muawiyah and they both loved each other and they both respected each other by the way in terms of their religiosity okay so whenever for instance Muawiyah sometimes he had questions to which the answers he didn't know what would he do he would send a messenger with the question to Ali bin Abi Talib you can imagine that they are actually you know facing each other and they're fighting over who is to rule the Muslims uh, at the same time Muawiyah will not negate the virtues of Ali and he will send to him a messenger with all the fiqhi questions to which Ali can respond okay so this is this shows the sort of respect the Sahaba had amongst each other despite of the rifts that they had amongst themselves and for this reason when the Sahaba when they were fighting amongst each other there wasn't this zeal to fight as, they, as it existed when they were fighting against the Mushrikeen okay there was not that zeal their hearts were not in that fighting at all. They were, their hearts were completely averse to it. And it shows that one of the things that actually shows the heart or the mindset of the Muslims at that time is when Ali and Muawiyah both were engaged in a fight and Ali radiallahu anhu was going to win that battle that Muawiyah, he told his men to put the Quran on top of the spears and say, look, let the book of Allah be the judge amongst us. And when the when the armies of Ali radiallahu anhu, when they saw their brothers holding the Quran on their spears, they said, we can't fight these people. We can't fight these people. And that was the end of the battle. So you can imagine, as opposed to fighting against the Khawarij, all the Sahaba were united against the Khawarij all together, and they were all happily fighting against the Khawarij, and they all happily, you know, they had the swords out, and they seeking the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as they fought against the Khawarij. But, as they were fighting amongst themselves, their hearts were not there. And the clear indication of that is what I've just said to you, the incident of the spears and the Qur'an. So, when this happened, you know, the, the Sahaba, they decided, okay, there's going to be arbitration. I'm rushing through it, really. They decided there's going to be, there's going to be arbitration. So, uh, you know, Muawiyah should uh, perhaps, you know, pick a person from his side, and Ali should pick a person from his side and they both should come together and make sulh, make peace between the two factions, come to some sort of resolution. So what happened is that when they decided on that, okay, there were several things that Ali radiallahu anhu had to do. One of the things he had to do was that Muawiyah for instance, he asked him to change his title from Khalifa of 
Allah or Khalifa of Allah's Messenger وسلم, to just Ali bin Abi Talib. Why? Because Muawiyah didn't actually recognize him as a Khalifa to start with. So Muawiyah, so Ali radiallahu an, Amirul Mu'minin, he had to cross that name, Amirul Mu'minin. Okay. Uh, and of course, that uh, you know, the, the fact that he had to actually accept men as arbitrators in this feud, all of these factors they gave rise to another sect. Which is this sect? The Khawarij. They were initially the followers of Ali ibn Abi Talib The Khawarij, when they saw this, that Ali is now trying to make arbitration between himself and Muawiyah. They revolted against Ali radiallahu anhu and they, they charged him with kufr. They said, you apostated. Why? Because you took men as arbitrators, whereas Allah says in the Quran, in al hukmu illa lillah. The, the hukum only belongs to Allah. Ruling only belongs to Allah. So you cannot take men as arbitrators to make swift between men. This was the first argument. The second argument was that Ali, you know, Ali radiallahu anhu, he agreed to strike out Amirul Mu'mineen in front of his name. And so the Khawari said, if you know Amirul Mu'mineen, then you must be Amirul Kafirin. And therefore, we charge you with the guilt of, with, with the crime of Kufr. And lastly, they said, Aisha radiallahu anha, she fought against Ali and she was subdued. Okay? But Ali radiallahu anha did not give anything from the, from the booty of that war to his warriors to the people who were, he, there was no ghanima so they were upset at that and they, they thought this is going against the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where uh, you know we, you're supposed to divide the booty which you get from the war so obviously they had uh, these sort of uh, grievances against Ali ibn Abi Talib and uh, you know as we know Ibn Abbas was sent to them and he refuted them uh, on all these three arguments and they said obviously you have no uh, theological basis to stand on, most of the Khawarij returned to the truth uh, some of them were left and then they were all fought and they were all killed except a few and one of those few that were left the survivors of that battle uh, he was responsible for the murder of Ali ibn Abi Talib so anyway going back to this in the beginning the Shia of Ali were just a supporting group. So at that time you can imagine there are people who are not exactly championing the cause of Ali, yet there are, the, there are those who are trying to champion his cause in his lifetime. And some of the kuffar at that time, especially the Persians, and especially one person, Abdullah ibn Sabah with, of Jewish descent, he decided to embrace Islam in order to use this opportunity to cause further rift amongst the Muslims. So. That's what happens. If you see two Muslim brothers, they're fighting amongst each other for whatever reason, and a person comes and starts inciting one brother against the other. He is like Abdullah ibn Sabah. The one who uses the, the opportunity to incite one brother against the other is the real fitna maker. And is like Abdullah ibn Sabah. And this is exactly what Abdullah ibn Sabah did. At that time, he saw that there is a rift, so he came and joined the ranks of Ali radiallahu anhu. And he didn't stop there. He started fabricating many ahadith, attributed, attributing it to the Prophet ﷺ, saying, the Prophet ﷺ said that Ali is such and such, that Ali is that, Ali is this and so on. And he started speaking, preaching for Ali, amongst his followers, reminding them of the virtues of Ali ibn Talib. Not only that, but also telling them that, that he is perhaps manifestation of God on earth, such that these people actually started worshipping Ali radiallahu anhu. What did Ali do to the, to the people? He burnt them. Okay? When he found out there's a group of people who are taking Ali as God and idol and worshipping him, he ordered that they be burnt. And uh, this is something that obviously Ibn Abbas disagreed with. He said that, you know, uh, burning is for Allah Azza wa Jalla alone. And it's reported in Sahih al-Bukhari. And, but this is what he did. At that time, obviously, Abdullah bin Sabah, he escaped from the punishment of Ali radiallahu anhu. And uh, he made his way to Persia. And that's where he started preaching his beliefs, Shiaism. So, this is how people took the opportunity to uh, widen the divide amongst the Muslim community. This, this is how they originally started off. Okay? So, in the beginning, 
it was just about the matter of supporting Ali radiallahu an. It had nothing to do with not respecting Abu Bakr and not respecting Umar. Over a period of time, Shiaism evolved and it became from political to like a theological school. Where people thought that Ali is more deserving of Khilafah and he's the best of the companions. That is more deserving of Khilafah than any of the rest of the companions. Okay? At the same time, they, uh, you know, they had the virt- they, they acknowledged the virtues of Abu Bakr and Umar, and they all said they are Muslims. That who those people who fought jihad alongside the Prophet ﷺ before conquest and after conquest, they all held these Sahaba in high regard. However, they thought that Ali is more deserving of that position, and these were the idea, okay. And they still exist in Yemen. The Zaydi Shia, they believe that Ali radiallahu an, they call him Ali alayhi salam as well. Uh, they say it's because he is from the lineage of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he is more deserving of Khilafah than anybody else. And then you had the Rafidah. The Rafidah, what is the story behind the Rafidah? The Rafidah came to Zayd and Ali. And they asked him, do you make bara'a from Shaykhain, from Abu Bakr and Umar? What does bara'a mean? Meaning, you, meaning you set yourself against the person. Not just disloyalty, not just like I'm free of you, but you actually turn as an enemy to someone else. That's what it means, bara'a. So when you say bara'a from shirk and ahlihi, bara'a from shirk and his people, meaning we, we are enemies to polytheism and all those who uphold polytheism. This is what bara'a actually means. So, they came to... Zaid, and they said, uh, do you make bara'a from Abu Bakr and Umar? They said, no. You know, they are the shaykhain, they are uh, from the most noble companions of the Prophet ﷺ and so on. And so they rejected, because they heard Zaid uh, praising Abu Bakr and Umar, they rejected Zaid. Okay? And from there on, they were called the rejecters, the rafidah. Rafidah meaning those who reject. Those who reject the virtue, or the, those who reject the companions of the Prophet So this was another obviously manifestation of Shiaism, Raf, and that is to to say that you are you have the wilaya or you you give your allegiance to Ali, and you disassociate yourself and you turn into enemy to Abu Bakr and Umar, because they claim that these people were the ones who took the Khilafah away from Ali radiallahu anh, even though it was his God-given right. This is what they believe. And then they obviously, as time passes, they evolve and evolve and evolve. And if you read the works of the Fuqaha, they will say to you that the Rafidah are generally Muslims. But the Ghulat al-Rafidah, they are not Muslims. Okay? Meaning the Rafidah are generally Muslims. The classical scholars... They all, you all, most often you'll find them saying in their works that Rafidah are generally Muslims. However, the extreme Rafidah are not. And what, who are the extreme Rafidah? Extreme Rafidah are those who make takfir of Abu Bakr and Umar and the rest of the companions. Extreme Rafidah are those who accuse Aisha, the wife of the Prophet ﷺ, of haram. They are the extreme Rafidah. Okay? And if you understand what the Fuqaha have to say about Raf itself and extremism in Raf and you apply to the contemporary Shia today, you will find that the most of the Shias that exist today are which ones? The extremist ones. Yeah? There's these Rafidah, they don't just say that Abu Bakr and Umar, they took the right away from Ali, rather they go a step further and they say that after the death of the Prophet ﷺ, all of the companions apostated. And this is the most ridiculous thing a person can suggest, the most illogical thing a person can suggest. You can imagine the Sahaba, you know, like in, this, in the thousands, hundreds of thousands, all together they conspired against the Prophet ﷺ and waited for him to die so they can take the Khilafah away from Ali. This is not something, it's like, you know, it's, like, it's more ridiculous than suggesting 4,000 Jews didn't turn up to work on 9-11, you know. It's ridiculous, because if you have such a huge number of people, 
involved in conspiracies, it no longer remains a conspiracy. It no longer remains a conspiracy. Anything that goes beyond ten people or two, three people, it's no longer a secret. Okay? So they think that all the Sahaba and the hundreds of thousands, they conspired against Ali radiallahu anhu. So while the Prophet ﷺ was alive, they all kept one face to him, you know. And as soon as he passed away, they completely rejected the message of Allah's Messenger and they went against the Khilafah of Ali radiallahu anhu. This is obviously absolutely absurd. Uh, uh, and you, can, you cannot imagine that the Sahaba who had sacrificed so much they sacrificed their homes in Mecca, you know, and then they migrated all the way to Medina, and then they fought alongside Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, got killed at Badr, some of them. Others were, you know, injured in many ways, uh, you know, and they, uh, and they had so many different moments with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in hardship and ease, that when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam passed away, these people just suddenly abandoned Islam altogether. So they say the, the Rafidah that exist in our time, they say that the entire generation of the Sahaba, they apostated except a group of three or four companions. They are the only ones who, who were those who were loyal to Ali radiallahu anhu, they are the only ones who remain Muslims. So this is one, of course, the Rafidah today, as far as uh, their beliefs are concerned, they have many, many shirki beliefs in them. Uh, because they're very close to Sufis as well. They believe in saint worshipping, they, they believe that the Imams have attributes of Allah, they believe that Imams know the unseen, the Imams know when they're going to die, they choose when they're going to die, they believe that Imams have control over every single atom of the universe, that nothing happens without their permission. This is basically attributing all the, uh, all the uh, qualities of Lordship to their Imams. Assalamu alaikum, ya Abba Tahara. <laughs> MashaAllah. MashaAllah. Um, so this is, this is what they believe. So today, the Rafida today as they exist, they're completely beyond the pale of Islam altogether, according to vast majority of the Muslim scholars. Okay? Uh, to mention that as far as the Hanafis are concerned, if you ask the Hanafi scholars of India and Pakistan, they will tell you that the Ja'afiris that exist in Pakistan and India, they are not considered to be Muslims at all. There was in fact a movement in Pakistan that's called Sipa Sahaba, which means the soldiers of Sahaba. And you know, God knows why they were established or whether they were genuine or not, but they did represent a general belief amongst the Hanafi scholars of India and Pakistan that the Shias are not considered Muslims to start with the Laqadianis. Claim to be Muslims, but they are not Muslims at all. Okay? And that applies to the, the laity and the clergy. Okay, that applies to their scholars and every single person who claims to be a Shia on the street. And as far as the scholars in Saudi Arabia are concerned, likewise, the vast majority of the scholars, especially the traditional Hanbali scholars of the country, consider the whole genre of the Rafidah today to be beyond the pale of Islam altogether. Again, the scholars as well as the laymen, every single one of them. And if you read the fatawa of Lajna al Daima, the, the fatawa of the, the committee of scholars in Saudi Arabia, they ask many questions like, you know, we, they, there, is, there are some tribes, the Shia tribes that exist on the northern border of Saudi Arabia. Is it allowed for us to eat their slaughtered meat? Is it allowed for us to marry into them and allow them to marry into us? And the response of the Lajna al Daima was very clear, as well as Sheikh bin Baz and others, that they are considered to be kuffar, and they are not to be married into, and they are not allowed to marry into us, and their dabiha and their slaughtered meat is not considered to be uh, halal at all. So likewise, you know, if you end up being uh, at a mosque today, where the person who is leading the prayer is a Rafidi, you are not allowed to pray behind him. If you ended up praying behind him, you have to repeat your Salah. And similarly, marriage taking place between a Shi'i or a Muslim is not considered a marriage. It's like, obviously, a marriage can, uh, taking place between a Muslim man and a Christian or a Jewish woman is a valid marriage. Okay? Unlike a marriage between a Muslim man and a modern-day Shi'i uh, woman. Is not considered a Muslim marriage because of these sort of reasons. 
Anyway, so th just to basically contextualize which Shia are you talking about? Because a lot of people, they quote texts from the previous generations of the scholars and they say that after that are Muslims. But the extremists amongst them are kuffar, okay? But if you go into detail and see how they define the extremist Rafida, then the description fits the modern Rafida perfectly. Okay? So, um, the Shaykh says, وَمِنْ أُصُولِ أَهْلِ السُنَّةِ وَالْجَمَاعَةِ سَلَامَةُ قُلُوبِهِمْ وَإِلْسِنَتِهِمْ لِأَصْحَابِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم. From the principles of Allah Sunnah wal Jama'ah is that their hearts are clean and their tongues are always clean towards the companions of Allah's Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم. كَمَا وَصَفَهُمُ اللَّهُ بِهِ فِي قَوْلِهِ تَعَالَى As Allah Azza wa Jal has described them وَالَّذِينَ جَاءُوا مِنْ بَعْدِهِمْ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا اغْفِرْ لَنَا وَلِأَخْوَانِنَا الَّذِينَ سَبَقُونَا بِالْإِيمَانِ وَلَا تَجْعَلْ فِي قُلُوبِنَا غِلًّا لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا رَبَّنَا إِنَّكَ رَؤُوفٌ رَحِيمٌ That those people who come after them, after the first generation وَيَقُولُونَ and this and, and uh, مِنْ بَعْدِهِمْ يَقُولُونَ and, the, and while they're saying رَبَّنَا اغْفِرْ لَنَا Oh Allah, forgive us وَلِإِخْوَانِنَا and forgive our brothers الَّذِينَ سَبَقُونَا بِالْإِيمَانِ Those who have already preceded us in Iman being the Sahaba they're the ones who have preceded us in Iman and we've been commanded to ask for their forgiveness some of the Salaf said that you know, Allah Azza wa Jal commands us in the Quran to ask for the forgiveness of companions to ask Allah for uh, to forgive the companions and yet these people, the Rafidah, they end up cursing the companions instead. Okay? This is what they do. If you go to YouTube, uh, this is what the Rafidah, they, they, they speak sometimes very slowly, eloquently to make sure that the, you know, the, the, the curse words are, are pronounced very precisely. They, they're not, you know, they make sure that you know, the Sunni who is sitting there listening to it is enraged by this. And when they mention Abu Bakr and Umar, they curse them, literally say, Allah alayhima. Okay? May Allah curse them both. They, this is how they speak about Abu Bakr and Umar. You can see this hatred coming out of them. And this, this is the genuine, uh, just normal Rafidi people in our time. And also, the Shaykh says, وَطَاعَةُ النَّبِيِّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ فِي قَوْلِهِ لَا تَسُبُّ أَصْحَابِ And likewise, we believe as a matter of principle, that uh, uh, what the Prophet ﷺ told us, لا تسبوا أصحابي Do not curse my companions. فَوَالَّذِي نَفْسِي بِيَدِي لَوْ أَنَّ أَحَدَكُمْ أَنْفَقَ مِثْلَ أُحُدٍ ذَهَبًا مَا بَلَغَ مُدَّ أَحَدِهِمْ وَلَا نَصِيفًا Do not curse my companions. فَوَالَّذِي نَفْسِي بِيَدِي For I swear by the one who has my soul in his hand. لَوْ أَنَّ أَحَدَكُمْ أَنْفَقَ مِثْلَ أُحُدٍ If one of you were to spend like the mountain of Uhud in Sadaqah, مَا بَلَغَ مُدَّ أَحَدِهِمْ If you were to spend a whole Mount Uhud in Sadaqah, it will not equal to a handful of Sadaqah made by the companions. وَلَا نَصِيفَهُ Not even half of it. Why? Because the ikhlas which they had in their hearts, as they are spending that fist full of Sadaqah, cannot be matched. Even if you were to sacrifice your entire life, if you're to sacrifice your parents, sacrifice your home, sacrifice every single penny you've ever owned in your entire life, the, the, the feeling in the heart, the sincerity you have in the heart, will never ever meet, match the sincerity the companions had in their hearts when they made sacrifice of even a dirham. Okay? So the, 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 the point behind this is no matter how much Islam you practice, no matter how much sacrifices you make for Allah's sake, no matter how many times you make jihad in the path of Allah, no matter how many mosques you establish, no matter how many Muslims you help, you will never be able to reach the status of a single Sahabi. وَيَقْبَلُونَ مَا جَاءَ بِهِ الْكِتَابُ وَالسُنَّةُ وَالْإِجْمَاعُ مِنْ فَضَائِلِهِمْ وَرَاتِبِهِمْ Likewise, Ahl al-Sunnah wal jamaah they accept wholeheartedly all the different narrations that have come regarding companions in the book of Allah and the sunnah of his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَيُفَضِّلُونَ مَنْ أَنْفَقَ قَبْلَ الْفَتْحِ وَهُوَ صُلْحُ الْحُدَيْبِيَةِ وَقَاتَلَ عَلَى مَنْ أَنْفَقَ مِنْ بَعْدِهِ وَقَاتَلَ And likewise, when it comes to prioritizing companions amongst themselves as to who is more virtuous than other, okay, who is more virtuous than other companions, then they, all, they go according to the book. 
So, فَيُفَضِّلُونَ مَنْ أَنْفَقَ قَبْلَ الْفَتْحِ So they give precedence to those who embrace Islam before Al-Fatih. The Fatih we are talking about here is إِنَّا فَتَحْنَا لَكَ فَتْحًا مُبِينًا Which is what? Hudaybiyah. That is the Fatih. You see? Not the conquest of Makkah. The Fatih which, which the Muslims thought was defeat. Right? This is the Fatih that we are referring to here. So, those of the companions who made jihad, who fought and who spent before Al-Fatih are better than those who made jihad and spent from their wealth after Al-Fatih. Okay, and you know when you read this, when you read about the companions, especially as to who is better than who, you get to read what the criteria is in Islam as to who is better than who. Okay? We're not talking about the criteria used here is not, you know, this person would pray Qiyamul Layl all night long. Or this person is the most, uh, is the person who memorized the Quran, all different qiraat. He's the person who gave the most charity. No. is the person who made jihad. That's how people were ranked. The one who sacrifices the most is the one who's ranked the most high. So you have jihad and then you have hijrah. So the people, the muhajireen for instance, who make hijrah, before everything else are better than the Ansar because they have Hijrah, the Ansar don't have Hijrah. Then the Muhajirin and the Ansar who have Jihad before the conquest of Makkah when things were difficult have more virtue over companions who embraced Islam after things were easy. After the conquest of Makkah and after the Sulh of Hudaybiyah when things became easier. Okay, so those people who made Jihad then at a time when it was very very difficult are more virtuous than those who made jihad at a time when it was easy. Okay? And this is with respect to any <coughs> activity in Islam you will find that let's say, you know, after 9-11 nobody wants to touch the prisoners. Okay? Because they've been targeted by the government and you know, if you go and ring up like a suspect terrorist the police may come around and start questioning you, start harassing you. So everybody Lead that obligation. Nobody wants to be involved in a work like this. So, those people who start up a work like this and get involved at a time where nobody wants to do it, they have the reward for starting it up over those who got into it when the organization became big and became like quite trendy in the Muslim community to go and help prisoners. Okay, because not everybody is doing it. Remember, in the beginning things are very difficult. And people in Islam are praised and they rank not because of how much they memorize and how much they speak or how good they speak, but in terms of how much they have really sacrificed for Islam. How much they have sacrificed for Islam. And this is how the companions themselves, they were ranked. Those who made jihad were above those who made jihad later. And of course, those who made, it wasn't, it was something you could not even conceive that they would be companions who did not make jihad. Which is why... The, the ranking can only take place amongst those who have made jihad before and those who have made jihad later. The ranking doesn't even take into consideration that there may be those who didn't make jihad at all because all the companions made jihad. So, because that, that was the spirit that obviously drove them at that time. وَيُقَدِّمُونَ الْمُهَاجِرِينَ عَلَى الْأَنصَار Likewise, the muhajirin are giving precedence over the ansar. وَيُؤْمِنُونَ بِأَنَّ اللَّهَ قَالَ لِأَهْلِ بَدْرٍ and they also believe that Allah Azza wa Jal has said to the people who participated in the great battle of Badr Do what you want, I've forgiven you all All those who participated in the battle of Badr This is obviously happened at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu with his companion Who was the Badri Who had participated in the battle of Badr In order to protect his family in Makkah he sent a letter to Quraysh saying that the Prophet ﷺ is coming to attack you. So what happened? Uh, you know, Allah Azza wa he informed the Prophet ﷺ that such and such has happened. Hatib ibn Abi Balta'a. So the Prophet ﷺ, he sent Ali and Zubair to this place where the woman was carrying the letter and they extracted the letter from the woman, came back to the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ opened the letter and there it was a letter from one of his companions who had fought at Badr, Hatib ibn Abi Balta'a, writing to Quraysh, saying that the Prophet ﷺ is on his way to you, 
and he's going to turn your, you know, fa- your, your entire township upside down, blah, 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 blah. But just as a curtsy uh, to my family, if you would spare my family, I'll be grateful. Because he had no tribal allegiance at that time. And so, so Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he called Hatib, you know, and he find out, spoke to him, what happened. And Hatib said, look, I did not do this because I want to be an apostate or because I'm trying to backstab you or anything. But I have my family there. I just wanted their interest secure. Okay? And so Umar radiallahu anhu, he said, allow me to strike the neck of this munafiq. Okay? Umar obviously was of this nature. And he was right. Allow me to strike the neck of this munafiq who conspires with the enemies of Allah against Allah's Messenger. So the Prophet in response, he said, leave him because you do not know Leave him. Perhaps Allah Azza wa looked at the people of Badr and said, uh, do whatever you want to do for I have forgiven you. So we also believe in that. Uh, and also, وَبِأَنَّهُ لَا يَدْخُلُ النَّارَ أَحَدٌ بَايَعَ تَحْتَ الشَّجَرَةِ كَمَا أَخْبَرَ بِهِ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ بَلْ قَدْ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُمْ وَرَضُوا عَنْهُ وَكَانُوا أَكْثَرْ مِنْ أَلْفَ أَرْبَعْمِئَةِ We also believe that none of the companions who pledged allegiance upon death to the Prophet ﷺ under the tree will be in the fire of hell because the Prophet ﷺ said so. What which incident are we talking about? Bay'at al-Ridwan. Bay'at al-Ridwan. It's called Bay'at al-Ridwan because that's when Allah Azza wa revealed the verse saying that He is pleased with the companions. Once Allah Azza wa is pleased with people, He will never ever be displeased with them. So these were the companions and there were 1,400 of them. So where the Rafidah who say that only four people remain Muslims and the rest apostated. 1,400 of them, Allah Azza wa is pleased with them before they even died. Because they all pledge allegiance to the Prophet ﷺ upon death. When they heard that Uthman ibn Affan has been killed. They all came to the Prophet ﷺ under the tree and they pledged allegiance uh, on death. وَيَشْهَدُونَ بِالْجَنَّةِ لِمَنْ شَهِدَ لَهُ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم. And they likewise, they testify with paradise for whoever Allah's Messenger ﷺ has testified with paradise. كَالْعَشَرَةِ Like the ten. Ten promised paradise. Who are they? Yes. Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, Abdurrahman ibn Awf, Abu Ubaid ibn Jarrah, Sa'id ibn Zayd, Talha, Al Zubair. That's ten. Okay? That's ten. So we believe that they are also promised paradise and many other companions who have been mentioned by the Prophet ﷺ, like Bilal and others who, whose footsteps he heard in paradise <coughs> I think what we'll do inshallah we'll stop here is, is to give justice to this topic inshallah I think it's better if we stop here and we continue the rest of the topic next week hmm? Yes, please. Any questions? No. Just to confirm, so it might turn out a bit of a controversial. <coughs> um, just to confirm about the hadith of Hashim, that only applies to a battery, right? Just so people are aware of that. So yeah, we will discuss. We will discuss that in a in a different setting, inshallah. Alaykum assalam wa rahmatullah. When you said that uh, the ranking due to the sacrifice, um, is that the sacrifice as in uh, just by wealth or sacrifice also physically by the blood? Sacrifice with physically number one to start with. Sacrifice, sacrificing your body is more virtuous than sacrificing your wealth. And sacrificing your body and wealth is obviously the best thing a person can do. I mean, what I'm trying to say is because is it sacrifice for war? Because we can say that because we're here now in this time, in this place now it's not exactly easy to do that sort of thing so being our jihad here dealing with certain things and certain issues 
is that a big sacrifice as well? And would that, you know, get higher than the ranking? Yeah, the more, look, the more the effort on your part, the greater the reward. And usually, it's easier for a person to sacrifice from his wealth than to sacrifice from his life. Okay, to sacrifice like his kids, for instance. Sacrifice your family so you can go and put a smile on another Muslim's face. That is the sacrifice itself. Okay, but the greater the sacrifice, the greater the reward, and greater the rank in the sight of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Ali Alaihi Wasallam. Ali Yes. Yes. Uh, we could do it uh, uh, extend on their situation of their shaykh the Rafila uh, that come from Iran, Iran they are uh, the Imamiya or the Ja'fariya the Twelvers uh, obviously they believe that the Quran has been tempered with, it's changed because the, the, the main focus of their belief, the main focus of their theology is what? the Ali is the Khalifa and the, the, the Imam of Ali an is the main focal point of the entire religion. So the dilemma for them is that how can that be the main focus of their religion, yet the Qur'an is completely free of it. How can, for instance, we believe as Muslims, Tawheed is the main objective for all Muslims. And our scripture is proof of that. Because every single chapter is about Tawheed. This is what we are about. So how can these Rafidah, for instance, on the one hand claim, that Imama of Ali an is the main focus of their religion and call, yet the Quran is completely silent about the most important aspect of their religion. So the only way they can come to terms with that is by believing and saying that the Quran has been changed, the Quran has been tampered with. That Uthman, this is where they fail squarely, obviously, trying to put the blame at his door. That when Uthman an compiled this Mus'haf which we know today as Mus'haf Uthmani, he uh, took out many of the passages in many of the surahs to do with the Khilafah of Ali an, and many of the passages that came apparently according to them censuring Abu Bakr and Umar and censuring Aisha anha. This is what they believe. So they basically they, they have a dogma, they have a belief and they create a fantasy world around themselves to answer or to, you know, to to answer all the illogical issues that arise due to their to their belief. They pray to they say they say as well, they I've seen that I've seen that yeah. they pray to them. Yeah, uh, the other thing with them is of, co- of course that they believe in grave worshipping as I said, uh, they believe that the Imams have supernatural powers, uh, powers that only Allah Azza wa has, like the knowledge of the unseen, the power to be able to uh, you know determine when a person is going to die. And of course they believe in making dua to the dead. They believe in praying to the dead. They believe in praying to awliya and the imams and so on. So all of these sort of beliefs obviously completely takes them beyond the pale of Islam altogether. Does um, Ahl Sunnah believe in the 12 imams? The Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah believe in 12 imams or 12 khulafa as mentioned in the, in the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ but that has nothing to do with the 12 imams these people believe in so among the 12 imams that we believe in the, or the 12 khulafa to be honest is uh, uh, for instance Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali these are the first four of the 12 khulafa okay and uh, others that are to come from the Quraysh as well so we, there is a hadith regarding that but it's got nothing to do with the 12 imams that these people believe in Okay, Barakallah Fi. No. Uh, the Shia, they believe their Mahdi actually went into uh, a cave. He w- he's actually been born, he was alive, he went into a cave and apparently disappeared. And they're waiting for him to re emerge out of the cave. As far as we are concerned, you know, to our knowledge, Mahdi is yet to be born. Okay? Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa tuubu ilayka.